Well, we're going to consider continue our study in current culture issues. Current culture issues. I was talking to somebody yesterday and telling them what I was doing, and they said, oh, uh, they uh, didn't think that they would like to have to deal with current culture. Well, I had a little trouble getting into this lesson. By the way, those of you that are visiting online, uh, welcome. And uh, those of you that are here, I printed off the uh, handout sheet with all the uh, sections on it. And you know where it is? Same place it was when it finished printing. I said to my wife as we were leaving the driveway, I think I left that on the printer. My, my brain says I brought it, but I, I didn't. So you'll have to wait till next week to get it. Or if you want notes, you'll have to take them on your own paper. Current culture. There we go. Biblical economics. Biblical economics. I looked at this topic, and uh, I had a hard time getting into it. It's a, it's a very interesting topic, but for some reason or other, I just wasn't. Anyway, I got into it before, before I got finished, and I got into it too far. And I... As I'm uh, going through some of these uh, lessons, I uh, look for some articles to read about them in addition to commentaries because most commentaries w would not have some of these uh, things in them. The commentaries are written some time ago. And the best, most of the best commentaries are written a long time ago and they wouldn't know anything about what's going on today. Principles are still the same, but uh, illustrations are different. And then I sometimes go and look for some sermons Sometimes I look for sermons from people who I would agree with, and sometimes I look for sermons from people that I would disagree with because I want to see what they're saying about some of these things. Because sometimes you can get some really good uh, biblical arguments when you hear somebody saying this, and you say, well, that's just, and so then you start going looking for some scriptures and you say, well, that guy is nuts, or you know, he's way off base or whatever, and it, it can reinforce. I don't advise you to do that on a regular basis, but anyway, I, I did watch some sermons on this and, uh, uh, and some, some uh, teaching classes. Uh, I watched one. I don't know who this guy was, but he's actually pretty good in terms of this topic. I don't know about any other topic, but he was good on this. And he started out his, uh, his uh, presentation. He was doing a presentation, like a one-hour presentation somewhere. And uh, he started out, he said, I have a story to tell you. So I thought I'd share it with you. It was kind of cute. It's, it's about economics, but sort of indirectly. He said, a little 10-year-old ten ten boy walked into a barber shop, walked in and sat in a chair. And the barber got a big smile on his face, and uh, he said, called him by name. He'd been there before. And, hey, Joe, or whatever. And, he went over to a couple of his customers. It was one of these barber shops that had several chairs. He went over to a couple of his customers, and he said, uh, "He says, buddy over there, he said, he comes in here all the time, but he says he never learns. He's, he's a little slow. He, he, he never learns. He said, you watch this. So he went over to the till, and he opened up the till. This was obviously a few years back. And he said he took out a dollar bill, and he took out two quarters. And he walked over to him. He had two quarters in his left hand and a dollar bill in his right hand. And he said, son, you can have whichever one they want. And he said, the gun guy grabbed the two quarters and took off. He said, I told you, he, 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 just does, he just doesn't get it. He said, he does this all the time. He just, he just doesn't catch on. And he said, I don't know why, but he said, he doesn't catch on. He said, I don't know why he doesn't take the dollar. So he goes on and on and on to his customers. Well, one of them was getting finished, and he went out. So as he was going out, uh, Joey's coming out of the ice cream shop next door with an ice cream cone with two scoops on it. And he's as happy as can be. So the man goes over to him and he says, young fellow, he said, uh, he said, I've got a question for you. He said, the barber in there, he said, he offered you two quarters in one hand and a dollar in the other. And he said, he said, you always take the two quarters. He said, how come uh, you didn't take the dollar? He said, well, that's simple. He said, the game would be over if I uh, took the dollar. So he was pretty. He was he was a lot smarter than the barber. <laughs> so there's a lesson in economics: take what you can get when you can get it, as long as you can get it honestly. He was getting it honestly, but uh, anyway. So biblical economics. 
what is economics? Well, economics is the study of the economy. And we have all kinds of people that, uh, one comment, one person I heard yesterday said, uh, all these people, they go to university for four years and get a degree, bachelor of, econom bachelor of business in economics. And then they go get a master's degree in economics and they get a PhD in economics. And he said, you know, they could save themselves a lot of money by just reading the Bible and getting the real economics. And he said they could do that in probably just a few hours, save themselves an awful lot of money and know an awful lot more than what they, all, what they know after all this training. And uh, he was right. Because you've ever noticed you get, uh, you listen to, if you choose to, uh, it's becoming less and less uh, valuable or even a, even or more annoying or whatever. If you listen to CBC or CTV and there's something economic going on and they get this talking head and that talking head and you get this third talking head and they've got, you know, PhDs from Harvard and Oxford and so on and they can't agree on anything and none of them are right because what they say is going to happen almost never happens. You know, the interest rates are going to go up and guess what? They went down or they're going to go down or they're going to stay flat and they went up or, or whatever. It's just guesswork. But there is some bi biblical economics. And uh, I really appreciated one preacher that I heard, and he said, you know, he said, I'm going to talk to you about economics, biblical economics, but he said, there's one thing that we can be sure of. He says, biblical economics does not affect the church. And I thought, really? And then he went on to elaborate. He says, Jesus built the church and he said the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He said economics can go up and down and change and so on but it doesn't affect the church but then he went on to elaborate it affects the people in the church but it doesn't affect the church. God's work's going to go ahead one way or another. He said I'm not worried about economics as far as the church is concerned. A little concerned about it as far as personal things are concerned but as far as the church is concerned it's not going to affect the church and I thought you know that's right God said he's the church is going to go the way he knows it's going to go and he's looking after it but it does affect us so there are some basic principles and uh, one guy said the basic principles of economics and and probably you can summarize it and we could we could all go and do another lesson after this you could summarize it with a couple of points and one is is be honest. Another, another one is make sure you don't spend more than you earn. And uh, he said if you look after those two things then uh, that's, that's pretty good economics. If the government would do that and if uh, you know of all levels would do that and we'd do that we'd be a lot better off. But there are some basic principles here and uh, we need to sort of be aware of some of them and we get bombarded with some economic ideas which are totally unscriptural and uh, most most of our governments I would say almost without exception in the world are infected by some very bad economic ideas just prob probably just about every government at, at every level have some very bad economic ideas so let's uh, there's two basic kinds of economics. There's positive economics and positive economics talks just about what is, what it is, like what, not, this is not a definition of, it's just what it is, that's positive economics, okay? If I do this, you know, if I have $20 I can buy this, if I have $30 I can buy this, if I have $40 I can buy this. It's just very factual, dealing with the facts of it. But I think my batteries must be uh, not where they should be. And normative economics is the study of what should be. And this is where we get into problems. If we talk about what is, uh, if you spend more than what you have, uh, that's a fact. And what's going to happen? then you're going to owe somebody some money, right? Do our governments have that problem? They sure do. Um, we, can't, we, we can never pay off the debts that we have as a government. Um, that's probably, uh, unless we all starve to death or something. 
But normative economics talks about what it should be. And this is where we get all these sort of rosy pictures of what the government should be doing. And then there's some philosophies behind all this. So there's some arguments and some issues. First of all, there's the numbers. In positive economics, we talk about numbers. And what happens if you're a positive economics guy? And, and that tends to be, and I'm not talking politics here now, there's basically two kinds of thought. And uh, positive economics would be primarily people who are small c conservative. I'm not talking about lip party, parties here. I'm talking about small c conservative, the ph conservative philosophy that you should live within your means, that you should uh, not spend money you don't have, that... Uh, and so on, that would be a conservative philosophy. And then there's a liberal philosophy, and again, it's a small L liberal, we're not talking about parties. In fact, you can go to some parties in the world that the liberal party is the conservative party and some other party is the liberal party in terms of economic philosophy. So you can't go by capital L and capital C. And you go to other countries where they, there's a conservative party or a quasi-conservative party or a neo-conservative party which has one name, and a liberal party, which has another name. But if you're a conservative or talk about numbers and the way things are, positive economics, what might you say to somebody who holds a different view? What might that person say to somebody who holds a different view from them? What might their attitude be towards them? They're wrong, yeah, okay. Yeah. I was watching a, a, a news item the other night or a, a news type program where there was some discussion going on and it's rather interesting. It was before I actually read, in, read this in this lesson and this actually happened. There were two sides. One was a conservative side and one was a liberal side and the conservatives were calling the liberal sides ignorant. They said, you don't know what you're talking about. And they didn't, but they just called them ignorant. They actually used that word. And uh, sometimes that happens. But the other side is all about, they say, about compassion. And they're all about calling the opponents, those who look at the numbers and say this is what's going to happen if you spend if we spend more money then we're not you know we're never going to be able to pay that debt off and so on that that just happened in the united states here their debt. they they weren't talking about how much money they could save or anything they were talking about how high they could raise the debt ceiling remember that discussion that just got done down there we're not talking about what's good and bad just how high can we raise it how what do we what can we agree on that we can raise it this high and uh, those who want to raise the debt ceiling and so on would call, and, th and this happened in this conversation I saw the other night, these exact words that they called the other people cold and heartless. One said, you're all about feelings, and the other one said, you're just about money and you don't care about anybody. Well, what's wrong with both of those arguments? Are there people on the compassion side who do have some understanding and uh, do have some concerns? Are some people compassionate and so on? Yeah. Are there some people who are compassionate or who are uh, concerned about numbers who are compassionate? Yeah, there's, there's, there's both feelings on both sides. But in general, and... Uh, in this same uh, program, they showed an interview with a, with a woman who was on the streets of a city in California, and she said, we've been spoiled. She said, we are, giving we, are giving a, we are given a cell phone, which is paid for. We are given clothing, we're given food, and we're allowed to sleep wherever we want. And she said, we're spoiled, why would we change? I mean, you're in California, the, the living conditions aren't too bad there under the worst of things as far as, time, as, far as weather and so on, Southern California, and uh, sleeping in a tent wouldn't be all that bad, would it? It'd be a little different from living in northern climes. But uh, 
These arguments go on. You can turn your TV on just about any day and see these arguments going on. Uh, we have it here in our city, don't we? About what, should, what should we do? We, oh, well, we, we would be heartless if we did this. We would be in, without compassion and uh, so on. So these, these are modern arguments. These are current. So as believers, we shouldn't just be concerned about numbers, and we shouldn't be just concerned about having compassion. We should have a, a balance, and the Bible does have a balance. The Bible has quite a lot to say about economics. It's all through it. So we're going to try to look at that. No, there's no human economic system that will ever be perfect. There never has been one. There never will be one because it's run by what? It's run by per imperfect people. Uh, the, the most efficient form of government, of course, is an absolute dictatorship. If you had a perfect dictator, are we going to have that someday? During the millennium, we're going to have a perfect dictator. It's going to be called the Lord Jesus Christ, right? He's going to rule with a rod of iron. If you don't like what he says, it's going to be, be a problem. Is everybody going to like that? No. No human economic system can be perfect. Perfect. So there's ways to organize an economy. Can somebody see if there's some batteries for this thing? Because this is getting a little bit annoying. Uh, any, do we have any uh, triple A's back there? Okay, the first uh, way to organize an economy, not, not necessarily the first in whatever, but is what's called the free market, or what's another name for the free market system? Capitalism. And that's one way. What happens when a seller can't convince buyers that his goods are worth their money? What happens? you have something to sell and you say, it's, I want $200 for it, what if you can't convince somebody that it's worth $200? What's going to happen? You're not going to sell it, right? What if you invested in, you know, if you spent a whole lot of money and made a thousand of these things and you have to sell them at $200 in order to break even? What's going to happen? you got a problem, haven't you? Well, that's what's called the free market. Do I have the right in this country to go out and spend a whole bunch of money on something or other and make one or two or five or a thousand of something and try to sell it at a certain price? I do. And whose problem is it if it doesn't work? It's mine, right? Now, what, what is our tendency when companies do this type of thing and they make a big financial mistake and all of a sudden they owe millions of dollars, what happens in our country? They go to the government and say, oh, we've got a problem here. You know, we've got uh, 25 people employed, and if we go under, they're not going to have a job. And what does our government do? They say, oh, too bad, we'll give you some money. How well does that work? Have we had some situations in this province in the last 25 years where that's happened over and over and over again. Have we had a, have we had a single one of those that uh, turned out well? I don't think so. You know, we've had one? Which one was that? Did it? Okay, well, that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad there was one. I don't know what one it was, but I'm glad there was one. Okay, that's what the free market is. You make your decisions, and you take your lumps, or you take your money. What if you sell something for $200 and make $100 on it? Is there a problem with that? What if you made, what if you made it for $25 and sold it for $200? Is, that, is there anything wrong with that? Not if somebody's willing to buy it, willing to pay for it. If you're a sucker enough to buy it, that's your problem, right? Do we do that? Do we buy stuff every day that's worth uh, five or ten bucks and it sells for 100 and, 100 and, 150? 
Yeah, we do every day. We all do it every day. Maybe not every single day, but collectively we do it every day. There's all kinds of stuff that we buy that if you knew the actual cost of it. I know, I know of a, I know actually, this is not hearsay, a case where, where a, a person went to Hong Kong. They were in the clothing business. And they bought ties. This person brought back a suitcase full of ties for which they paid the equivalent of two Canadian dollars each. And they put them on sale for over $50 each. And they were a deal because their other ties were $60, $75, $90 and so on. And people thought they were getting a great deal. And I guess they were in a sense. And everybody was happy. Is, there, is that wrong? But we buy stuff every day. Those ties that you go, if you're foolish enough to pay $75 for a tie, how much do you suppose it actually cost? Probably two or three bucks, maybe, maybe as much as five. I mean, I'm talking delivered to the store. I mean, Joseph, you know all about this. You know what you pay for stuff, and you know what you charge for it. And I'm not saying that's wrong. But sometimes people go to the store and say, I'm getting a really good deal on something or other, and really it's still about three times what it should be. Right? That's our free market economy. Is that wrong? No, it's not. Is it wrong to raise the prices just because you can to take advantage of a situation? That is wrong. Did we see that recently? Have we been? Have, are we seeing that right now? I talk to retailers all over the place, and they say this is this is what we're charging for this, but it shouldn't be that price. But we're using, you know, that five-letter word that starts with C and ends with D and has an O V I in the middle of it, and it usually has capital letters. We're use, we're still using that as an excuse to gouge people. And that's not right. That's, that's wrong. But, you know what? We still go buy the groceries, don't we? We still go buy the cars. We still go buy the clothes. We still whatever. So that's free market. So if somebody comes along and says, well, no, no, that's not right. We shouldn't have that. Everybody should have the same. And the state owns the property and controls the economic system. That's called communism. Can you think of a country that's fairly close to us that's uh, that way? Cuba. Cuba. Uh, if you're a taxi driver, and I don't know the exact numbers, uh, but if you're a taxi driver, what type of wages do you earn? The equivalent of uh, like a dollar a day or something like that. If you're a doctor, what do you earn? Pretty much the same as the taxi driver. If you're uh, whatever, what do you earn? Pretty much the same as the taxi driver. What's wrong with that system? Well, are there some people in that country that are rich? Are there some people in that country that are filthy rich? Yeah. And they're the guys that make the rules. Now, could communism in its pure form be a good thing? Could it be? If, if everybody was taken care of and everybody was treated equally and so on, could that be a good thing? Well, it probably could, but guess what? It's never going to happen. Why? Because we have sinful people. Do you know what? There has to be somebody in control. Otherwise, you have what? Chaos, anarchy. Somebody has to be in control. And you know what happens to those people in control? What's the old saying? Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts? Absolutely. Do we see countries all over the world that used to be prosperous and then they got a communist government? Can you think of, think of some that, uh, that are, you know, they're in the news from time to time? Can you think of some? One on this, well, there's more than one, but sort of the major one in this hemisphere is what? Venezuela. Venezuela. 
It used to be a very prosperous country, a very wealthy country, all kinds of wealth, and it's totally destroyed. People are eating, you know, they're eating garbage. They're not everybody, of course, but uh, there's some really rich people, and they weren't rich before they got in government either. It destroys. Uh, you can go to the African continent. Are there a bunch of countries there that used to be prosperous, and now they're poverty-stricken, and people can't get enough food? Zimbabwe is probably the prime example of that. It's a breadbasket of the country, and now people can't even get enough food. So communism doesn't work. It might work in theory if everybody was perfect. And by the way, what example do they use from the Bible to say that communism is a good thing? There is an example that gets used a lot. What about in the book of Acts? The early church, there was a big problem. There was a famine. And it says they had all things in common. And they say, well, that's a form of early communism. Christians should be communists. What's wrong with the argument there? Did they have all things in common? Yes, they did. What, but what's the, what's, the, what's the missing point? Uh, um, Chad? Right. This was something that they did. Would it be wrong if we had a serious situation in our country where there was a lot of people in Grace Baptist Church that just were basically going to starve to death? Would it be wrong for us to pool our resources and help everybody else? Would that be wrong? Nope. It wouldn't be wrong. But whose idea would it have to be for it to be right? It would have to be our... Could we have a church meeting at Grace Baptist Church and, and come to an agreement that we're going to pool all our resources? We're going to open one bank account, Grace Baptist Church Relief. Everybody's going to put their money in there. What, what would have to apply to that? Pardon me? Well, Joseph, no, no, you're wrong. I, sorry, but Joseph did that, but that's not the same as us having a meeting and doing it. The Egyptian people had no say in it. Joseph was an absolute dictator, and they did as he said. They pooled their resources, but only because he said so, not because they wanted to. I'm, we're talking about here about us wanting to. Would that be wrong? No, it wouldn't. If, well, if everybody agreed, but everybody wouldn't have to agree, but 90% of us or 80% of us could agree, and there could be 10% that didn't agree and didn't do it too, right? We couldn't force anybody to do that. In a communist system, you all have to do it whether you want to or not. That's the difference. So the state owns the property and controls the economic system. And then we have this wonderful thing called socialism. Have you ever heard that word on the news Ever heard that word in discussions? Of course you have. Do you know, the news avoids it quite often, though. Do you know why? Socialism does not work. It never has. It never will. In socialism, you're still allowed to own things and operate things, but who makes the rules? The government makes all the rules. They'll tell you how much you can how much you can charge for stuff, and they don't care if it costs $20 to make it and they sell you, tell you you have to sell it for 19 then you are required to make it and you're required to sell it for 19 and even if you're going to lose money on it. Um, state owns the tools to produce the goods. They make the rules. And profit and capital accumulation are discouraged. Have you heard the statement by, made by some fairly high-placed people in the world that said, uh, we're going to bring in a system where you will own nothing and you will be happy? How many have heard that? Yeah, it's out there. And I could give you some, le some letters that have said that. I mean letters as in WEF that have said that. You're going to own nothing. But you'll be happy. We'll provide you with an apartment. We'll provide you with public transport. We'll provide you with clothes. We'll provide you with food, and you'll be happy. Well, I don't think so. But anyway, 
So those are basically the three forms of economic systems there are. By the way, has communism been around? Did it just happen in 1917 when the Bolsheviks took over Russia? Has it been around before? Yeah, there's examples in history where it was there and didn't work then, doesn't work now. Socialism, has it been around? Yes, it has. Uh, it started long before that. It started pretty much uh, after the Garden of Eden when sin entered into the world. So, biblical economics. Let's find out what the Bible says and see which system best aligns with God's principles. First of all, we have responsibilities as private individuals, as private stewards. So we're talking about Christians now. We're not talking about the world. They have responsibilities too. By the way, do you hear much about, when you hear all these economic discussions on TV or whatever, do you ever hear that word come up very much? Responsibility. No. The only time it comes up is we have a responsibility to look after everybody. You know what? I don't have any responsibility to look after you. Do you know whose job it is to look after you? It's your job to look after you. Now, should we be concerned about one another? Yes. Should we help one another? Yes, we should. But your responsibility for your household is whose? Yours, not mine. Right? So, this is where this stuff goes askew. Now, let's look at Psalm 24. We've done a lot of talking. We should look at the Bible. This is a Bible study. And we've got a lot of verses. We're not going to get near most of them today because we had a lot of background to talk. Psalm 24. Did anybody quote Psalm 24, verse 1? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. Who owns everything? We sing that little, ver little song. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. If you have a bunch of cows, who owns them? God. If you own a tin mine, have you talked about Simon Patino that owned all the tin in Bolivia at one time? Considered the 16th richest man that ever lived. Uh, he didn't give much credit to God, though. Who owned all that tin? God did. By the way, this, this is just a little anecdote, and I, and I guess I probably knew this, but I'd never thought about it. But do you know that there's at least, there's, there's several, but do you know one copper? Uh, one, yeah, I just told you the answer. <laughs> uh, do you know that copper never wears out? Copper is infinitely recyclable. Interesting. Other things kind of deteriorate and as you recycle them, they, but copper is infinitely recyclable, resmeltable and so on, and re infinitely recyclable. They say all the copper in the world that's ever been mined is still in circulation. And they say all, but there's probably some. It's in circulation in some form. Interesting, isn't it? What happens to steel, or iron, I should say? What happens to it? It rusts and deteriorates and crumples into nothingness. Copper, this goes on forever. Now it does get a patina on it and all that from. Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter one. This is, we probably won't get much farther than uh, this particular section, but that's all right. Genesis chapter one. What did God tell Adam and Eve? And God said, this is a summary, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And what are they supposed to do? Let them have, have great. Right, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over everything that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him. Male and female created them, and he said, God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. He didn't say they belong to you, they belong to me. 
but he said you're supposed to run look after them you're supposed to be stewards that's our key going to be our key word here we're supposed to be stewards of god's dominion god owns it he owns cattle on the thousand hills wealth in every mind uh but we're supposed to look after it we're not supposed to destroy it we're supposed to look after it how well have we done with that down through the centuries not real well. We've done, you know, I don't know what we get, maybe a, maybe a C minus on that or something or other, a D. But uh, we certainly haven't done really, really, really well. Now, have we, have we done well in uh, using the resources? I mean, has it done well for us, the resources? But have we always done it in a stewardship manner? Or have we just kind of wasted a lot of stuff? Are we a wasteful society? We sure are. And we're all there, aren't we? Sometimes we're forced into being wasteful. We don't have any choice, but we are a waste. Genesis 2.15, let's look and see what God said there. And God, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to do what? Dress it and keep it. This was before the fall. What was Adam supposed to do? Four-letter word. Starts with W. Work. He was supposed to work. Is work a result of the fall? No, it's not. God created man and told him to work. Work is a good thing. No work is what? I'm not talking about if you're out of work. But a no working person is what? It's not good. You know? Pardon me? Well, we'll... That's right, he's not supposed to eat. We'll get to that verse. But uh, no work, what does it do to people? You start getting lazy, and then what happens? Everything falls apart, and it falls apart up here first, doesn't it? Right, it's not a good idea. Genesis 3, after the fall. 17 to 19. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. They had a better idea, right? Do we ever have better ideas than God? I mean, in our minds. I mean, we, we don't have better ideas than God, but do we sometimes have better ideas than God? Yeah, we think we do, don't we? How well does that work out? Never. Never works out well. God said, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shalt, shalt it bring unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb, herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. What did Adam tell, uh, God tell Adam he was going to have to do? Same thing he told him before the fall, except that now there's going to be a lot of problems. Before the fall, there weren't any thorns and thistles, and he just had to work, and maybe he didn't have to work that hard. I don't know. But he had to work. He had to look after things. Now he's got to work, and he's got to bust a gut, so to speak, to do it. Genesis chapter, or Exodus chapter 20. What's in Exodus chapter 20? Right. What did God say there? Uh, I didn't put this verse in, but what does verse 9 say? Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. And on the seventh day you're supposed to rest. That's what he told Israel. But on verse 15, what did he say? Thou shalt not steal. What's the implication of thou shalt not steal? There's a, there's, a, there's a lot more in that verse than thou shalt not steal, four words. What's, what's implied there? If you can steal, what does that imply? It implies ownership. If you can steal something, somebody must have owned it. If they didn't own it, taking it wouldn't be stealing, would it? If it was just sort of common property. So that means that the Bible talks about personal ownership. It doesn't talk about common, everything being in common. 
Could we have everything in common? Yes, we could, but that's not the standard. Hebrews 20. Hebrews 20? I don't think so. Uh, And see if I can remember where that verse is. I can't even remember what it is now. Uh, Is it 2? Maybe it's 2.17, is it? No, I don't know which verse that is. I got a typo there somehow. Proverbs 14.4. Proverbs have anything to say about work and property and so on? Proverbs 14.4. We'll have a lot of verses in Proverbs before we're done here. Proverbs 14.4. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increases by the strength of the ox. What's that saying? What's what's the around that? If you don't have a tractor, you're not going to farm. Is sort of what he's saying. Isn't that sort of what? what if there's no ox, the crib is clean. There's nothing in the barn. You don't have any ox. You don't need anything. But much increases by the strength of the ox. If you want to, if you want to farm, you have to do some work. And if you want to get better at farming, you have to have some tools. Now you have to be careful on that. We have a history in Canada, probably in the U.S. too, but a history in Canada. What happened when the West got opened up? I'm talking as far as farming, so I'm not talking about the Wild West in terms of cowboys and Indians and all that stuff. I'm talking about the West as far as farming is concerned. What happened out there? Anybody know the story of the West? What what happened to people who went West? They were given a chunk of land, right? And what were they supposed to do with it? Supposed to farm it. So they did. They started hoeing and digging and digging out roots and so on. And then somebody got a great idea. Somebody called a banker. He got a great idea. And uh, he went to Mr. Smith, Mr. Lewis, Mr. whomever. And he said, you know, I got a great idea. You're just working yourself to death here with all these hoes and shovels and picks. And he said, you know, if you've got a horse, uh, a horse could do a lot of work for you. Well, I don't have any money to buy. No, but we could lend you some money to get a horse. Well, that's a good idea. So they lend him money. He gets a horse. But what's the horse going to do for him in terms of his farming? Horse is going to want some oats, right? So what else is he going to need? In order to get the hay, what's he going to need? He's going to need some tools. He's going to need a plow, isn't he? And maybe a harrow. And maybe... And then once he starts getting a little bit of stuff, what else is he going to have? He's going to to have to build a shed to put it in, right? You see where this is going? And then where this went? So you get... So the farmer comes back next year and he says, boy, you're, you're doing pretty well. You know, if you had two horses, you could do twice as much. This happened. This happened in the West. So what, where did the farmer end up after 10 or 15 years? He ended up totally in debt to the bank. And you know what the bank did? The bank came along and said, uh, Mr. Smith... Uh, you know, we really like doing business with you. You're a, been a very good customer, but you know you owe us uh, 500 bucks. I mean, back in those days, that was probably what, what he would owe. You owe us 500 bucks, and you only made 400 last year. And uh, this isn't a very good economic thing for us. Do you know what we're going to do? We're going to take your farm. And then they went to Mr. Green, the next farm, and they said the same thing to him. And then they went to Mr. Jones in the next farm, and they said the same thing to him. And pretty soon, what did the bank have? They had three or four or five, six farms, and what did they do? They sold it to some big corporation, and the big corporation took over. I'm not making this up, folks. You can dig it. You can, you can look it out. You can look it up. This happened to thousands of people in the West. Not just in the West, but it was very prominent there. So these people worked. They worked hard. 
and they lost it all. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Because what did they, what principle did they forget about? You have to pay for what you get and you have to have some resources to do it. And if you don't have some resources to do it, it's going to cost you. 2 Corinthians 5, and we'll close with this. This is the, the root of all of our economic troubles. 2 Corinthians 5. I uh, don't think I've got the right verses here. Well, th they apply, but they're not the ones I was looking for. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That th this, is a, this is a verse that applies to our attitude and so on, but it's not the right verse. I've probably got another typo here. The verse that's supposed to be there is the one that says, uh, with, with food and raiment to therewith be content. Do you know, what is the, you know what is the root of all our financial woes? Discontent. Discontent. I'm not going to ask anybody to put up their hands, but do you know what? We, we're all affected by that. Discontent. The Bible says we're to be content with what such things as we have. What about the farmer? Were they doing okay digging stuff by hand? Was it wrong for them to get a horse? No, but it might have been wrong for them to get it this year. Maybe they should have waited till next year when they had a little bit of cash. See, this is the problem. You get discontent. And that's the root. So, Let's leave it there and pick it up next week. I thought I was going to get through this whole thing this, this week, but there's, there's lots of stuff there. Pardon me, Mary? Is it First Timothy 6, 8? Okay, well, I'm not sure what, there was a Corinthians passage there. I could look it up in my, we'll, 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 uh, we'll fix it up next week. But thanks for looking. Okay, let's pray. Father, help us to be content with such things as we have. Help us to be good stewards of what you've given to us. Help us to seek you first, put you first in, a, in all of our priorities. And it says if we seek you first, all these things will be added unto us as, as to meet our needs. We thank you for the day. We thank you for the opportunity of being here. And we pray for the morning service that you'll bless there in Jesus' name. Amen.